you know, for a show that TNA built up as much as this one, for a show that really needed to be a success in order for the company to take that next step and continue to get out of the impact zone, I would think that they'd want to put a lot of effort into this. I would think that under the circumstances, they'd want to do everything in their power to make this a great show. I was wrong. Now before I really start tearing into this thing, I have to ask a question. Aside from the Las Vegas show, this was the first impact outside of Universal Studios and the first impact done in a real venue. And I'll say this, that made a huge difference. The show looked more Major League, they had a big crowd that was pretty hot, even though it was mic'd horribly, and this was such an improvement. The look and the feel of the show was so much better than when it's in the impact zone. So it would stand to reason that you'd want to spend as much time in that arena as possible and really let the viewers soak that in, wouldn't you? I guess not, because literally 70% of this show was backstage pre-tapes. Jesus Christ, did you really need that many? I mean, the ones promoting the main event, okay. I mean, they got redundant towards the end, but you can leave those in if you want to. But did you need all that wedding stuff when the ceremony itself was already going to take up more time than every wrestling match on the show put together aside from the main event? The pointless crap with Eric Young and Orlando Jordan. Did you really need that too? There were a few other things that needed some attention on this show. And no, I'm not talking about all the ubiquitous celebrities. How many fucking celebrities can you cram into one show? I mean, there is such a thing as overkill TNA. But they had that guy on commentary. I, I, I didn't even know who he was. They had Bart Scott get beat up by Kurt Angle. They had that bimbo from the Jersey Shore come out when she's not even on the fucking show anymore and challenge that other bimbo from the Jersey Shore to a wrestling match. I mean, my God, they, they were just begging for ratings with all this. Begging. And they made no bones about it. The show didn't have a title this week, but if it did, it might as well have been TMZ bait, Sports Center bait, MTV News bait, Access Hollywood bait, Entertainment Tonight bait. I think that covers all the bases. Here's a crazy thought, TNA. Instead of making all these shameless and obviously desperate ploys for attention, why don't you try to get ratings by actually producing a good show with logical booking, competent writing, and occasionally a wrestling match that doesn't suck? Or is that just beyond your creative team's ability to deliver at this point? They start the show off with Dixie, and she says that the judge she supposedly had in her back pocket has ruled in favor of Hogan and Bischoff. Yeah. Even though she has video evidence of them committing massive multi-million dollar fraud. Even though she has literally millions of eyewitnesses to the fraud being committed. Even though the fraud was committed on national television, the judge has ruled that Hogan and Bischoff now own the company legally. So they're back in charge and Dixie's out. Again. Which means that, essentially, nothing at all has changed. We're right back where we started, and this entire protracted legal battle storyline, all this waiting, all these months of buildup with them jerking us around by dragging this thing out, has been a complete and utter waste of fucking time. But hey, don't take my word for it. Let's get a second opinion. Let's take it to the professor himself. Mike Tanay, what did you think of this? Oh, what a bunch of bull****. Yeah, that was pretty much my opinion too. Then they had Sarita versus Velvet Sky, where Velvet's career was on the line. After months of build-up to this match, there were no pre-match promos. They don't even bother to show the heel's entrance. The match is overbooked all to hell and less than two minutes long. They didn't even try to make it seem like Velvet's career was really in jeopardy. And after it's all over, before you can even digest what's happened, they start the Jersey Shore crap and dive into some stupid publicity stunt that had nothing to do with this. And to add insult to injury, rather than do the smart thing, they actually had Velvet win the match. I guess what they were going for here was some kind of underdog story where the good guy gets beaten down over and over again, and then when all the odds are stacked against them, they pull out the performance of a lifetime and finally triumph over their unbeatable opponent. But when your protagonist is Velvet Sky, who's piss poor as an in-ring competitor, is that really a wise decision? Velvet's never going to deliver any performances of a lifetime, we all know that. Nobody can when the match is that damn short. So you essentially spent the last several months building up a storyline for which there would be no payoff. And that's really disappointing because when they first announced this retirement stipulation, I thought it was the perfect way to not only push Sarita to the next level as a heel, but to also phase Velvet out as a wrestler at the same time. Now let's be honest with ourselves here. What are Velvet's best qualities as a performer in this business? She's really hot and she can cut a good promo. That's pretty much it. Does she have to be in the ring to do either of these things? No. 
And when they do put her in the ring, it never turns out good. That's why it made no sense for Velvet to win this match, because she shouldn't be a wrestler. She should be a manager. She should be in a role like the one Cookie has, where she's a manager for someone else and only wrestles sparingly, like once every couple of months. You still get Velvet Sky, she can still do everything that got her over, but without subjecting people to her crappy matches every week. I mean, hell, the only knockouts that have ever been able to carry this chick to a watchable match were Gail Kim and Taylor Wilde. Maybe Roxy a few times, too. I think Serena can do it, but her matches with Velvet have been booked all wrong. Most of the time they call for Velvet to dominate the match until Sarita gets the victory at the end. And that's stupid because when Velvet is booked to carry a match, it is a bad match. And that's not me being a hater. That's the God honest truth. If Velvet carries the match, it is a bad match every time. So I really don't know what the point of this was. Velvet beats Sarita in about 90 seconds. So what? The match was immediately forgotten when the Jersey Shore crap started. Is this going to change anything for Velvet? No. She's never going to be at the top of the card. Maybe she'll win the tag titles again one of these days, but there's no point in giving her big singles victories because she's never going to be the singles champion. And why? Because she is a really bad wrestler. Of course, that didn't stop them from putting the title on Madison Rain, but I've already been over that a thousand times. Beer Money had their title match with the Jobber Security Guards. It was really short and really boring. Gunner and Murphy suck. They have not had a single good match yet. Get them off my television. Then Ink Inc. come out and challenge Beer Money for some reason, and just like that, we have a title match for the pay-per-view. Ink Inc. are an upgrade from the Jobber Security Guards, so maybe I shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth here, but they've been on TV maybe once or twice in the last few months, and now they're just getting a title shot? What kind of sense does that make? I expect the match will be fairly decent, and it's possible we could see Christina Von Erie debut here, especially if Ink Inc. turn heel at the pay-per-view like I think they're going to, but you couldn't put a little more effort into setting this up? You couldn't at least give them some wins on Explosion or something before having them come out to challenge for the tag titles after vanishing for months on end? The more logical team to put in this spot would have been Generation Me. At least those guys were in the title picture recently. And hey, how about this? You could have Gen Me win the tag titles and then join Immortal as the henchmen of Matt and Jeff because people are always making the Hardy Boys comparison anyway. You know, it would, be, it would be a good way to give those guys a rub. And that way, Immortal now has a tag team that can actually deliver a good match, which means that there would be no reason for Gunnar and Murphy to be there anymore so you could kick those losers the hell out. Scott Steiner and Rob Terry had a match. No surprises here, it was slow-paced and boring as hell. Steiner wins clean, so I'm hoping and praying that this feud is just being blown off now because someone in the writer's room came to their senses. The main event was Jeff Hardy defending the world title against the big mystery opponent that the network set up. Then Sting came out to the surprise of no one because they telegraphed that in the video package last week that they ripped off from WWE. Some people have been saying the video was a parody of the 221.11 thing, or it was TNA taking a shot at WWE or something like that. That's probably what they meant it to be. And you can call it a parody if you want to, but... In my opinion, if you're going to make something that's almost exactly the same as what the other company is doing and call it a parody, you've got to earn that. You've got to prove that you can come up with original creative ideas on your own first that are just as good or better. And, sorry, TNA, but uh, you, have, you have so not done that yet. It may have been intended to be a parody, but to me it came across as a ripoff. The match was mediocre, Sting is really limited in the ring at this point, and Hardy pretty much phoned it in. It wasn't very long either, I think they only gave it like six minutes. Longest match of the show, by the way. And Sting wins the world title. Again. Huzzah. So now we're supposed to be excited about Sting coming back. Sting. The same egocentric son of a bitch who not only knew that Bischoff and Hogan were plotting to steal TNA from Dixie Carter months in advance and did absolutely nothing to stop it, despite having countless opportunities to do so, but who then let the takeover happen and afterward left Dixie to twist in the wind when she was begging for his help. That's the guy. That's the guy that we're supposed to be excited for. That's the guy who's coming back, who's riding back on his white horse to save TNA instead of someone like... Fortune? Kurt Angle? Ken Anderson? Rob Van Dam? Samoa Joe? The Pope? Doug Williams? Matt Morgan? Motor City Machine Guns? You might think that those people, or at least some combination of those people, would be better choices, wiser choices, choices that might benefit the company a little more in the future than someone like Sting. 
You'd be wrong, apparently, because in the minds of the people running TNA, Sting is superior to all those other people put together. That's the message that they're sending here. So they bring back Grandpa Sting after he half-assed it for the entire last year he was in the company and just hand him the world title again. This is stupid for the following reasons. Number one, Sting can't wrestle anymore. The last match he had that was even halfway decent was against AJ Styles at Bound for Glory 2009. Every match he's had since then has been lousy to mediocre, including this one. Number two, even when Sting was still in the ring on an occasional but semi-consistent basis, he was still stinking up the place. But by now, he hasn't wrestled in five months. Do you think that's going to help matters any? And now he's coming back after sitting at home, doing nothing for nearly half a year. At least it looked like he'd been hitting the treadmill a little bit, but that doesn't change the fact that this guy's got five months of ring rust on top of being old as hell. Number three, in case you haven't been paying attention, Jeff Hardy has been having a pretty spotty track record with his in-ring work since he won the title at Bound for Glory. So now you've got an unreliable champion versus an aging, unmotivated Sting. Surprise, surprise, the match wasn't very good. And if these guys are going to have a prolonged feud for the title, that's probably the best it's going to get. You want to bring Sting back, you have him mentor a young star. You don't put him in the main events, and you sure as hell don't give him the world title. The man's 52 years old. He's never been more irrelevant in his entire career. Hell, I don't even like Jeff Hardy, but I'll say this. Jeff Hardy is a bigger star than Sting. It wasn't that long ago that Jeff Hardy was like the second biggest star in the industry. Sting hasn't been that big since 1997. Christ, if you wanted to flip-flop the belt back to a babyface champion, you should have just kept it on Anderson. And I'm not one of these guys who think you need to get rid of all the veterans just because they're old and it's not their time anymore. In my opinion, as long as the veteran can still give 100% effort, if he can still give good performances without being totally outshined by all the young talent, then yeah, he deserves his spot. I don't believe he should be pushed that hard necessarily, but he deserves a spot. Kurt Angle's not the youngest guy in the company, but you still get incredible effort from Kurt Angle. He still gives amazing performances, so he deserves his spot. Christopher Daniels. If TNA brings back Christopher Daniels, I'm jumping for joy, because he can still perform just as well or better than any young talent I can name. With guys like Kurt Angle and Christopher Daniels, you still get great effort. You still get great performances. You don't get that from Sting anymore. And why? Because he doesn't care. He doesn't give a rat's ass anymore, and it's obvious. Dixie, you think Sting re-signed because he cares about you? You think he cares about your company? He doesn't give a shit. He came back for a paycheck. If he cared about his performance whatsoever at this point, then why did he completely phone in every single fucking thing he did in 2010? Get a clue, TNA. The bloom is off the fucking rose with this guy. God damn, this pisses me off. And I guess I'm saving the worst for last. This god-awful vow renewal crap with the Jarrett's. An angle that featured Orlando Jordan in a fucking dress. A ceremony they made us suffer through not once but twice. A storyline that had quite literally half the show devoted to it. I mean, and granted, maybe it was getting a reaction from the crowd, but Jesus Christ, did you need that much of it? I mean, it's, it, it's, just, it's, it's over and over with this crap. This is a huge part of the problem, you know. This is why they can't feature any young stars effectively right now, because the Jarrett's have just consumed this goddamn show like a black hole. And I just... I... No. No. I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm not gonna do it. I refuse. You're not gonna get me this time, TNA. You're not gonna get me. Because this time... I came prepared. Ha-ha! Come on, you mother motherfucking childproof lid! Come off! God damn you, come off! I really don't want to review this part. <laughs> and guess what? I'm not going to review it. I hit the mute button during this segment, so you can't make me review it because I didn't watch it. Fuck you. Fuck you. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm free.